بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا ومولانا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم قال الله تعالى وابتغ فيما آتاك الله دار الآخرة ولا تنسى نصيبك من الدنيا وأحسن وأحسن كما أحسن الله إليك ولا تبغ الفساد في الأرض إن الله لا يحب المفسدين وقال تعالى في مقام آخر وعد الله الذين آمنوا منكم وعملوا الصالحات ليستخلفنهم في الأرض كما استخلف الذين من قبلهم وليمكنن لهم دينهم الذي ارتضى لهم وليبدلنهم من بعد خوفهم أمنا يعبدونني لا يشركون بي شيئا ومن كفر بعد ذلك فأولئكم الفاسقون وقال تعالى كنتم خير أمة أخرج للناس تأمرون بالمعروف وتنهون عن المنكر وتؤمنون بالله Brothers and sisters, I've been asked to speak about uh, the golden age of, of Islam. I've been asked to speak about the golden age of Islamic civilization. By some metrics, it is considered to stretch from the ninth, ninth century after Hijrah to the 14th century. It was during this time that Muslims pioneered innovation and discovery in almost every field possible. It could be argued that it was simply humanity's time to bloom. It was just time. It was time for humanity to reach this point in our development. And we happened to be the ones in power at that time. But such a perspective fails to give credit where credit is due. The world owes a great debt to the Islamic civilization. And reflecting on those achievements does a great service to Muslims today. Within the first century of Islam, Muslims began to progress rapidly in countless fields. I'll name a few. Fine arts, textile, geography, shipbuilding, seafaring, trade and exploration, physics, chemistry, medicine, mental health, agriculture, and urban development. This is a long list. The libraries were much longer. In medicine, we had the likes of Ali bin Rabban at Tabari, pioneering works in medicine. In physics, we had the likes of Ali bin Muhammad bin Hassan al Haytham authoring many books in physics and mechanics and chemistry. In mathematics, we had the likes of Muhammad bin Ibrahim bin Fazari, a long list of people over and over and over again. A leading Orientalist, German Orientalist, she pointed out that in the year 1000 AD, Hundreds of librarians worked in two libraries of the Khalifa, which included over two million books. She claims that it was in this year that a well-known Muslim physician authored a major work on surgery. It was in this same year that Burini discovered that the earth rotates around itself. And for all of our photographers in the room, it was in this year that Al Hassan and Haythami authored works on the rules of eyesight, and today is known as the man behind the camera. I have a question to ask you. Why do we talk about these great accomplishments? Is it simply to relish over the days long past? Is it simply to be happy about what we used to do? To gloat and state fun facts at the coffee table and at our dinner parties? Is that the objective of such knowledge and discussions? I think a deeper question must be asked. 
How did Muslims become such great leaders in innovation? How did we become the pioneers of exploration? What was their inspiration? I'd like to quote Abu Hassan Ali Nadwi, an amazing scholar of the Arab and the Ajam, who has authored many books, one of which I'll quote from today. Mada Khasir al Alam bi intihat bi inhitat al Muslimi. What the world lost by the fall of Muslims. He writes, and I quote Humanity has many signs. Humanity has many sides physical, emotional, social, moral, mental, and spiritual. We cannot neglect one for the benefit of another. And humanity cannot progress to its highest level unless every aspect of humanity is brought into play. It would be futile to hope for the establishment of a healthy human society until the intellectual, material, moral, and spiritual environment is created in which a person is able to develop and reach their full capacity. The legacy of Islamic civilization begins by realizing that we are multifaceted creatures of God. There are many aspects to who we are. And he writes that civilizations have gone through an ebb and flow sometimes only highlighting the material aspects of who we are and sometimes only looking at the spiritual aspects of what it means to be human. He says that when a society only focuses on the, the material, they leave an important aspect of who the human being is out of the equation and they miss the mark. And when a society only focuses on the spiritual aspect of what it means to be human, they also miss the mark as well, not thriving in different fields and sciences. I remind you that we stand today at another great moment in human progress. The development of AI has the potential to transform the world as we know it. Speaking with a leading scientist of AI, Muslim, just a few weeks ago, he said that it is my estimation that within the course of five years to 10 years, many people will have a best friend that is an AI bot that they can chat with, talk with, and interact with. Why am I bringing this up? Because when we look at what the Muslims did for civilization, it was a balance between their belief in Allah and their understanding of who we are as human beings in relation to God, but also their understanding of us as being the Khalifas of God on earth that allowed them to progress and make such great strides forward. The Muslims of China were developing ships that make the Nina what is it, Pinta and Santa Maria look like canoes as we were traveling around the world. So the concept that is important to understand, and I'll quote what Abu Hassan Ali Nadwi, he said. It is a, a, a brilliant point. He says, Muhammad Asad, he says that, he, he, he summed it up that the Islamic concept of life as a well-balanced, harmonious totality. We are not purely created for the Akhirah, and we are definitely not created for this dunya. What do I mean by that? The Quran speaks of a Christian ideal that was wrong, a type of monasticism whereby the physical body and everything of this world was completely rejected. A a type of shunning of this world that leads to celibacy and completely shunning away from the dunya. That isn't the Islamic way. But at the same time, 
Abu Hassan Ali Nadwi, he says there's another extreme, the extreme materialist, innovation for the sake of innovation, technology for the sake of technology, progress despite where it might lead us to. He says either one of these extremes are very dangerous. And so this leads me to my primary point for today. What we need today, we need our young generation to thrive in areas of innovation, progress, AI, everything we can imagine. But why though? Because we hold a mentality that allows us to be the proper custodians of these technologies, not innovation for the sake of innovation, but innovation for the sake of being creations of God. Innovation for the sake of moving humanity forward so long as that progress has the moral component as well. The idea here is profound. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he sums it up beautifully in the verse that I began with. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَبَتَغِي فِي مَا آتَاكُ اللَّهُ دَارَ الْآخِرَةِ وَلَا تَنْسَ نَصِيبَكَ مِنَ الدُّنْيَا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, remember, my point is that we are multifaceted. We have one hand in the heavens and one foot on earth. Meaning, that we strive on this earth to bring things forward, to help humanity. But at the same time, we never forget that we're holding on to this akhirah. That's the place that we're going. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَبَتَغِي Strive. Strive, work hard. The reason I say this, let me break this down a bit. The reason I say this is we have two extremes amongst young people. We have an extreme amongst young people, which is, I'm not into deen, I'm not into spirituality, but I'm extremely intelligent, mathematic, I'm extremely STEM oriented, and I can move forward. But my spiritual side is whatever, it's not a big deal. And then we have another side, people that are extremely inclined to the deen. And that inclination can often lead to, oh, who cares about the dunya? The dunya doesn't matter. We're leaving anyway, la. Rasul Sai said him in a sound hadith, a sound narration. He said, if you're planting a tree and you have a sapling in your hand and the horn of Qiyamah begins, plant the tree. Because we have a, 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 a job and a role to fulfill of Khalifa. It is not coincidence that so much of what we benefit from day, today were seeds planted by Muslim scholars. Muslim theologians, because it was their understanding that these were things that were part of my right and responsibility as a servant of God. And so this verse that I, I, I'm, I'm reciting sums it up beautifully. Strive for your akhirah. Strive for your akhirah. Go after your akhirah. But don't forget your share on this earth. Don't forget your part of bringing benefit to society on earth. In another verse that I recited at the beginning of my talk, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah promises those who believe amongst you. الصالحات, and those who do righteous deeds, they have the, their hand in the akhirah. They have that stronghold on where they're going. That we shall give them strength on this earth. We will put them in charge. The same way we put their ancestors in charge. And we will give them stability and make their deen and their religion strong. Abu Hassan Ali Nadwi, he says, the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam laid a foundation within the Sahaba. That foundation was that, yes, we are traveling through this world and this is the primary message for today. 
We are traveling through this world and it is temporal. But that doesn't mean it doesn't matter. This dunya matters to God because it, we have to plant the seeds. He's made us khalifa. When you make someone khalifa, that means you care about, you want that thing looked after. And so the meaning here is profound. The Prophet Sallallahu he first planted the seeds of moral responsibility in the hearts of Sahaba. He taught them that their greatest responsibility is the debt that they owe to God. And when inside of them, the mentality was established that we have a debt to pay back to God, what they then realized is that we also have a debt to pay back to humanity. We have to cultivate our mental faculties. We have to cultivate whatever skills are necessary to bring progress to humanity, to bring goodness to people. This is who we are. We are the ones that bring goodness to people, but never let people forget where we're going. I heard a poet say, a spoken word artist say something so beautifully. He said, you're somebody's ancestors. So act like it. You're somebody's ancestors. Oh, you mastering computer science. You're someone's ancestors. Oh, you mastering biology. You're somebody's ancestors. Oh, you mastering physics and chemistry. Oh, you're someone's ancestors. You, oh, civil engineer. You're someone's ancestors. Somebody will look back and say, my grandfather used to do this. So act like it. Bring goodness to the world. The fall of our golden era came not because we lost our skills in the STEM realm, but rather we lost our connection with God. We lost our connection with our Dean. In the moment we lost that, we lost the right to be in charge. The Rasul Sai said them, he said, Allah will uphold the nation if they are just even if they be kafir. Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam hadith Qudsi. Even if they are kafir, disbelievers in God, but they uphold justice and truth. Abu Hassan Ali Nadiwi, he says, we reached the point where we lost sight of the akhirah. So when we lost sight of the akhirah, all of our progress meant nothing to God. So the message is clear. You are someone's ancestors. Act like it. Progress. Move forward. The golden era of Islam is not one that has long passed us to talk about in speeches. The golden era of Islam is what you will make it. The golden era of Islam is what you will cultivate. And guess what? I have a bitter pill for you to swallow. It's not green, red, or any other color. It's just a bitter pill. When Genghis Khan and the Tartars came during our golden era, we were wiped out. The stories written by Ibn Kathir and others are horrendous to read. As Muslims were pretty much wiped from the face of the earth. This was at the peak of our golden era, but we had lost connection with God. And luxury and hayat dunya became our primary objective for all that we did. What happened is that only a short time later, the very people that conquered us became Muslim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says it clear to us. He tells us, if you turn away, Allah says, Islam will progress. Islam will pass on. Muslims in inner cities around America, people are accepting Islam in droves. Day after day, shahada, shahada, shahada. These masjids in Sufuf will be filled. 
The question is, will you be there? Islam will reach its golden age again. The question is, are you going to be the names that people read about 100 years from today? May Allah allow us to be the innovators and pioneers of tomorrow. May Allah allow us to work in this dunya, as the hadith says, as if it will last forever but work for the akhirah as if it's coming tomorrow. May Allah allow us to have that balance within us. And I'll end with one verse again. Strive for what God has given you for the akhirah, but don't forget about the dunya. You're someone's ancestors, so act like it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to not just think about a golden era long past, but think at what inspired that and become that for the future. Jazakum Allah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.